We all good morning. Uh, happy Easter. And here's 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 the one where I can tell if you're actually awake or not. He is risen. Okay, congratulations. You made it this far. You're gonna do dandy, y'all. Hey, it is really really good to have you here with us on this Easter Sunday. I'm glad that you are here to worship with us and to uh, declare to one another uh, and to make known. Uh, in our community, that Jesus is alive. Uh, would you join me in prayer as we come into this time? Lord, we're grateful for this day and for all that it holds, the, the meaning that it carries with us as we recognize that what you have done in Jesus is conquer death. That, uh, that you did something that no one expected and in a way that nobody expected, uh, not quite like that. Um, and that you beckon us into that life with you. That it's not enough just that you uh, have conquered death in Jesus Christ, but that you beckon us into that life to share it and to live inside of it, uh, to know that that same life for those of us who know you uh, waits even on the far side of our own deaths. That those are things we don't have to be afraid of anymore. Uh, that you've taken that great uh, specter that hangs over human existence and, and made of it nothing at all. What a wonder. Lord, we ask that as we spend this hour uh, singing praise and reading scripture and meditating on your word, that you'd be present among us. We ask that uh, we would notice it. We ask that in all of our hard-heartedness that you would speak clearly, uh, that we'd, we'd gather our attention uh, and sense the way that you may be speaking to us, calling us into a new life or a new kind of life altogether. We are so grateful that you love us like that, that you are that attentive to who we are and who we might be in you. We know that that's how deeply you love us because we find it proved in Jesus. We find it proved in him uh, taking up a cross that was our cross and dying and being raised and coming out of a grave that was our grave. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let's worship together. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we would like to invite you to stand up if you're able, and we can read together uh, a passage in the scripture as a call to worship. <clears throat> Let's read. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. Let's sing together.
Our reading today is from Isaiah 25, from 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that envelops all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And this is the word of the Lord. Alleluia.
Okay, well, hallelujah, there's a bunch of you here. All right. Hey, um, okay, what do I have here? A eggs and a... Uh, do, do any of you do egg searches like yesterday or today? Okay, we still do it. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, when I was little, we used to use real eggs. They were hard-boiled and stuff. Uh, but, and maybe people still do that today, but a lot of times nowadays they use these plastic ones. Were the ones you collected yesterday or today, bla today plastic? <clears throat> a lot of times. And is there usually something inside of them? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. That's the important thing. Okay. Hey, would you hold that for me? Thank you. Um, hey, well, I'm going to let four of you open some of these up and we'll see what's in here. And it's kind of got a, a story in it. Okay. I'm going to close my eyes and pick. Who am I pointing at? You in the back. Come up here. Okay. Okay. You need to pick out the blue one. So pick out the blue one, and let me open it for you. Would you hold this for a second? And when I open it up, you tell me what's in here. Pick that out of there. Okay, there's a little cross there. Okay, and, and I had you pick that because uh, the cross reminds us that Jesus carried that up onto Calvary to die for us. Okay? So put that back in there. Thank you. Just set it right there. Good. Okay, we'll do this again. Okay, random picking. Okay, who am I pointing at? Oh, you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, pick the green egg out of there, if you would. Okay. Yeah, okay. You hold it. There's something in there. I, I think it's something sparkly. Sparkly? Okay. Okay, okay open your hands. What's there? Um, nails. How many? Three. Okay. And the reason I put three nails in there is Jesus was nailed to that cross to forgive our sins. He gave his life, life for us. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Okay. And uh, let's see. Oh, I need another volunteer. How about you? How about this one right here? Could you help me? Okay, so pick the purple one up. Okay, now it's heavy, isn't it? What's there? A rock. A rock. Okay, now that rock is to remind us of the big stone, the big stone that rolled over, they rolled over the tomb to keep Jesus in there. So thank you very much. Okay, okay, good. Okay, you guys go back. Okay, random picking. Oh, no. Okay, okay. Oh, come down here. All right, sir. This one, open that up and tell me what's in there. Okay, it's empty. Okay, but it's empty to remind us what was in Jesus' tomb on Easter morning. Was he in there? He, it was empty. Okay. So go ahead and have a seat for a minute. So, so these four things, Jesus carried a cross up Calvary for us. He was nailed on that cross and he suffered for us because he loved us. And somebody had to die because of our sin, my sin. But that's not the end of the story. They put him in a tomb, even put a big rock there to keep him in there. But nails couldn't hold him. Rocks couldn't keep him in the tomb, could they? He rose. And I'd like you to look up behind you here. Okay, we've done this before, but see the cross? Okay, and see the window up above it? Okay, so I really like those things. It, you have a cross, and then look at the wood behind the wood cross here. Uh, how is it different than the cross? What's the wood doing behind the cross here? Yes. That's going out like the sun rays and also that window. And I think it's cool to think that the cross had to come first. And then from Jesus' death comes life and love and, uh, and hope. So when you look at that, it took the cross to 
then result in life and love and stuff. So um, this is a big day. This is the biggest day in, in Christianity. So thanks for coming up here and let's pray. Oh God, our Father, thank you for loving the world so much that you gave your only begotten son that he who believes in him should live forever and have our sins forgiven. Thank you for this day. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, dearly beloved. Hey, I want to mention a couple of things that may be a little bit of a departure from the way that the, the portion of the service we're entering into normally goes. Um, Y'all, we do not have children's church today. We have our children in the room here with us. And so there are two things that you may benefit from knowing about in conjunction with that. The first thing is, uh, if you end up having a very small child or a medium-sized child who ends up just being very fussy, uh, we do have a space where you can go just down this hallway and to your left. Uh, and you're welcome to avail yourself of that if you need it with that kiddo. Uh, we uh, have the service on, on a live stream in there. And so we will try and, and make it to where you can still participate even if you need to excuse yourself. The other thing I want to mention is um, if we do have uh, children fussy or squirmy or otherwise, the rest of us are going to be very sweet about that. <laughs> okay. All right, y'all, we're going to be reading today from the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be reading from the 16th chapter. We're going to start in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 8. Uh, the, the oldest manuscripts in Scripture uh, stop right there. They have those eight verses, and they draw right up short. And so we're going to follow that today as we read. As I read it, I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version. That may or may not be the version out of which you normally read. And if it isn't, that's okay. Because while the words of the text may be just a little bit different, the spirit behind it is going to be very much the same. And as we read in Mark 16, starting in verse 1 and down, what we read is this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who is crucified. He's risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God, and thanks be to God for that. Can we pray together? Oh Lord, in these next moments, we ask that you would draw near to us. We ask that you would open our eyes and unstop our ears. That you would quicken our minds and soften our hard hearts. And that these words would truly be for us a word from you. Amen.
This week I read a story about a woman named Lynn Thompson. It's a newspaper story. But the newspaper story was not by any stretch a news story. Unfortunately, Lynn died in 1995, just a few months after that story was written. And the story was about this woman from Nashville who loved her flower garden and who was trying to teach her spouse how to carry it on when she wasn't there anymore. But inside of that sort of simple scenario, albeit a really painful one, it was a story that was a lot bigger than that. It was a story about a normal woman trying to face a normal death, even as she continued to live a very normal life. The story tells about what that looked like in Lynn's final days, about her gardening and speaking with her husband about it. It tells the story of her going to see Forrest Gump, of all things, when it was new and in the theaters, and how the friend that she went to see it with expressed some regret to Lynn after she looked over and saw her weeping in the theater. I'm sorry, said her friend. Lynn, I didn't know so many people that are loved to die in that movie. But that wasn't what had upset Lynn. That wasn't it for me, she said. But the wedding was. What did it for me is all the things that I know I won't be here for. Now Lynn's husband, her widower, Warren, the man she was teaching to keep up her garden, Warren died last week. And the reporter who had originally written that story back in the mid-90s, took it as an occasion to pay his respects by reissuing it. I think he did so with the benefit of the intervening years and knowing that that story, even though it probably meant something at the time, means a little bit more to him now. By his own admission, that reporter, like many of us, has had a chance to come to grips with the reality and the finality of death. And that window into this normal death of a normal woman who is living a very normal life. Y'all, that is still so resonant. It's resonant even to folks like me who never knew Lynn Thompson. I bring that up because, y'all, as we arrive here at the Easter story, we need to recognize just how present this type of terrible normal really is to all of us. If we live very long at all, we end up having to find ways to grieve and to cope with and to move through those awful billowing waves that death leaves on the surface of our own lives. There are many of us who can attest that years later, there are often still ripples that those waves leave behind. And we know also that someday, unless something wonderful happens, that we will be leaving behind waves of our own in someone else's life. It's a painful facet of this life. It's a universal thing. So many people in every culture have sought to find ways to navigate it with whatever modicum of grace and hope they can muster. You find rituals of memory and of thanksgiving and of commending those we love into God's care that surround moments of grief like that. And I mention those things because, y'all, the Easter story always starts there. It has to. You know, it starts in a moment like that, not because it's necessarily the most compelling place to pick it up. It's not because some screenwriter punched it up and made it camera ready. It starts there because that just happens to be the way Scripture tells us it starts. It's Mark 16, verse 1. tells us this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? 
Now, as a pastor and as a son of a pastor, I have to confess that these first several verses we read about these women trying to take up this meaningful work of mercy, and they feel so normal to me. You can sense the pain and the grief in this passage. That's there. But man, right next to it are all these faithful women. Late to be named in the Gospel of Mark, but Mark wants us to know constant faithful companions and presences caring for Jesus' needs all throughout his ministry in Galilee, even here coming with him to Jerusalem. And he describes these ladies in that peculiar mark and language of discipleship as those who had followed Jesus. We wake up on that Sunday morning with them, and y'all, they're still doing it. They're doing it even through their grief. They're doing the thing that they've always done, which is the thing that needed to be done. And so one last time, these ladies get up early, and they're going to go and find Jesus' body and look after the last needs that he will ever have. On the evening of the Sabbath, when sundown came, vendors would open up their shops in Jerusalem. These ladies had gone to the marketplace and they'd purchased spices and fragrant ointments, the kind of thing you would need to begin that long process of caring for the body of a loved one that you'd lost until their remains could be gathered up and stored somewhere permanently. Well, there's every reason to think that this would have been an ongoing process, that they'd simply taken up as a matter of course and duty. It's just the right thing to do. In the midst of their grief, they're carrying on with the thing they know they're supposed to do for those you love. Year by year, with no regard for the danger or the scandal that it might cause for them, these ladies had already set out in resolve to care for Jesus' body throughout that process. I think that's why the story that I started telling about it this morning, that's why that jumps out to me. You know, there's this gesture towards the mundane of life, even in the midst of the awful wake of death. And in Lynn's story, and even in this story for these followers of Jesus, it was just the same. They just carried on doggedly. With the normal burial process of the day. With that normal confrontation of death inside of their very normal lives. Just normal ladies. But as they make their way to that tomb on that morning, the only folks we can tell among Jesus' followers who seem to have noticed even where it was, by the way, they come to the realization that they've got a problem. Now there's this stone the stone wedged in the doorway. We think of it as just sort of rolling shut. It was really made to roll in and then press inside, almost like a cork in a bottle. It's stuck in there. It had all happened in such a hurry, the burial and everything, and on a holiday weekend to boot, that none of them had thought through how to get into that tomb. Nobody had bothered to leave the entrance cracked for them. Now, as a matter of fact, in other gospel parallels, what we find is that the powers that be had reason to make sure that these ladies couldn't get in at all. But in Mark's telling, the problem is even more pedantic than that. They'd bought all the spices. They'd resolved to do this hard bit of work in the midst of their grief. And the thing none of these ladies seemed to have noticed or to have planned on or around or had any solution to offer toward is how to get the doggone door open. Well, aside from being what I think is kind of an interesting little nod to the veracity of this story, just the fact that this is the thing these ladies are thinking about, is that I think it's a detail that reminds us just how wonderfully interruptive Easter is. As these ladies move toward the tomb, they're doing what so many of us do, not just in grief, but even in our day-to-day. -day. They're hung up on what seem to be, in the moment, insurmountable obstacles. Now, they cannot, in their wildest imaginings, believe that they'll be able to get through the door. Much less are these ladies able to anticipate what they'll find or not find inside of it. And y'all, we do this sort of thing all the time, don't we? 
We can worry over big things. We can worry over the day to day. It's just normal. Y'all, we've all got stones in front of the tomb. These faithful ladies aren't alone in that. We join them right there in that same frame of mind. We do it day by day. It can look like for us sometimes a breach in a really important relationship. Sometimes it looks like a financial burden. Sometimes it is a good and holy burden of care for young ones or for elders that we love. It can be, as it was in this story, just a stone of grief sitting there right in the middle of your life that just feels unmovable. Now, these are not insignificant things, even if they are part of the normal course of life. But the thing we find out in this story is that even stones like that are movable. Verse 4 says it like this, But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now, these ladies knew the obstacle that stood in the way of their task. They were convinced they were going to that tomb to care for Jesus' body. But we find here, writ large, God's wondrous and peculiar way of outstripping human plans and concerns and showing us that the challenge of the moment can be dealt with even in a moment. And that new, full resurrection life can bloom right there where that stone has been. Verse 5 goes on to tell us this. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Y'all, in an instant, the obstacle in this story is gone. And the task, by the way, that they'd set out on, it's obsolete. It changes for them, and it changes that fast. It's so fast and unexpected that they are bewildered. Now, not least because there's a body in this tomb, and the body isn't Jesus. They're met by this young man, certainly an angel. But I like that Mark doesn't ever describe him that way. He's just described as a young man in white formal wear, just sitting there, waiting, carrying none of the worry these ladies arrived carrying for themselves. This angel comes in human guise like a walking, talking sign that there are completely different ways of being alive that these ladies hadn't considered. Like a sign and seal that Jesus is in the middle of one of them right now. And when he speaks, he drives that sense of new life home even further. I'm going to hazard my own translation of it here because in the wonderful woodenness of the Greek, if you're listening, y'all, it's almost funny. And I think it's supposed to be. This is how it sounds. The ladies arrive terrified, and he says, don't be terrified. The Jesus you seek, the Nazarene, the crucified one, has been raised. He's not in here. Look at the place they put him. And at this point, I have to wonder what went through their minds as these women became the last folks in human history who ever went searching for Jesus and couldn't find him. Everything in the course of a normal life. Everything in our normal interactions and in their normal interactions with death. Y'all, everything about that would lead them to believe that they'd go into that tomb and find Jesus. But the Nazarene, the crucified one, he wasn't there. Now, the message of Easter is that about 2,000 years ago, human existence made a sudden pivot and marched off by God's grace in a completely different direction. And that even the people who lived through the middle of it didn't realize it was happening until it had already begun. 
And we have three followers of Jesus who figured they'd just go about their weary work, carrying on with their duty, dealing with death, and whatever other obstacles they met along the way. And by verse 7 of this chapter, we find out that the obstacles aren't obstacles anymore. We find out that death has been defeated. And we find out that their duty has changed. Verse 7 says it like this. Go! Tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. Beloved, what was true then is true now. It will be true forever. This Jesus, the Nazarene, the crucified one, is alive. He wasn't there where they put him because he's risen. Inside of the truth of that, all the obstacles and all of the burdens that we may face, y'all, how can they help but be rolled away? Death has been defeated. Y'all, that long, dark thread that has bound up all of human existence, it is slowly unraveling. And a day is coming when it will slip that last seam with one final sigh and the song of the redeemed will break out and carry on beautifully and boundlessly forever. Now all the ways that we too have to move through life with this stunted, misshapen understanding of what is natural and what is normal. Y'all, all of that is in the midst of being rolled away. There's no power that can stop that. There's no wound that you've received. There is no wound that you've given that can change it. It is the one great cosmic truth. And it will pass in time from faith to fullness with God himself as the guarantor. That is a wonderful thing. And... I think that's why this last verse in Mark 16, 8 has been such a source of puzzlement for over a thousand years. This is what it says. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Y'all, I want to be crystal clear, just in case the English doesn't do it justice. Y'all, this is the language of flight and fear. Bewilderment isn't a bad translation. More literally, it's that they were outside of themselves. You might say outside their own heads, even. It's such an uncomfortable final verse that even early Christians sought to bring it in line with the story that they knew so well. Your copy of the scriptures likely has two different attempts to do that faithfully, sitting right there side by side from Mark chapter 16, verse 9 and down. And if we stop right there, and I think we're supposed to, there's a temptation to read this as Mark just releasing us back into all of that struggle and stress of normal life. We can read it as Mark just dismissing us to go on and consider death as something that we now encounter, but now with maybe this faint little hope in our hands. But y'all, I have to tell you, I don't think that's it. I think Mark is concerned with just about anything you can imagine, except for reacquainting us with what is normal after a moment like this. And I'm going to tell you why. It's a wonderful story of a man named Nicholas Winton who, as a young man, was a stockbroker in London in the 1930s. And after taking a vacation to Prague during that season of his life, got a sense of a very real need for families in that part of the world. And he began moving Jewish children into the UK. Y'all, he did it through forgery and chicanery and 18-hour days for months on end. And when war broke out and the trains he was filling up finally stopped moving, he just went on about his normal life. And he did it having gotten 669 Jewish children out of the Czech Republic and into safety in Britain. 
You know, I didn't talk about it for 50 years. Never brought it up. But news got out, and in 1988, somebody at the BBC found out about that story, and they invited him on a public interest program at the time called That's Life, where they would tell the story of people, just normal Britons like him. And as they did this for Nicholas Winton, they mentioned in the course of the program that some of the children that he had saved, that he'd gotten out of Czechoslovakia, were there in the audience. And they asked any who felt that they owed their life to Nicholas Winton, who happened to be there, if they might be willing to stand. And y'all, men and women and their children, every person in every single seat surrounding Nicholas Winton for five rows back rose to their feet. Now, I've mentioned before that Mark is our oldest gospel. That's the scholarly consensus, and it's convincing to me on its own merits. But it matters too for moments like this. I cannot help but wonder if Mark doesn't end this gospel this way in the language of fear and flight, knowing full well that in the first churches where this gospel was read, in the first churches where this story was told, at the moment where it was finished and rolled up and set aside, that there were men and women in the room who rose to their feet to tell about the risen Jesus they had seen. To tell of how that terror that they felt melted away and turned into joy. And who now, having had that experience, looked ahead even towards the possibility of their own death. With the faithful conviction that even that now would be anything but normal. So I would love to have been there. When some old woman named Mary or Salome stood up and opened her mouth, maybe into a radiant, toothless smile, and proclaimed among those believers what we gather to proclaim again today and have proclaimed for over a thousand years, that this Jesus, that on that Sunday she went looking for, the Nazarene, the crucified one, that he wasn't in that grave. That he is risen. And that she'd seen him. I wonder if she'd go on to tell. How every obstacle and burden. Every concern or care. She'd carried from that day to this one. Had been lived in the light of that truth. That her normal way. Of facing even death. Had become for her. And for you. And for me. Anything but normal. Beloved, Jesus is alive. He is alive right now. He lives and he offers that same life to you. The den of death is drowned out in his victory song. And as he rose, we who know him will someday rise as well. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we pray together? Will you take just a moment in silence to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit who may draw near to you to minister something brand new or to correct something I said incorrectly? But trust that that faithful spirit is with us and listen for that voice right now. Lord, we confess in our smallness and in our wickedness and in our limitedness, it is so very easy for us to decide with improper confidence that we know exactly what's normal anymore. That uh, we know how to confront death and our own troubles and obstacles. That we know that they are just things we get through that Maybe we even find ourselves desperate enough to think there are no ways that you might intervene and change our story. And we love coming to this story, Lord, because if we will really listen, what we'll find is that none of that is true. 
We're reminded as we accompany these faithful followers of Jesus toward that tomb that the thing we worry about on the way there and the thing we leave knowing are different things entirely. That beyond the obstacles we imagine to be the main feature of the day, so often there is life and life abundant and of a different kind and quality and duration than what we've been looking for in the first place. And Lord, we confess that that's a gift. That's something you win for us because you love us. That's something we had no hope of grasping on our own. And it's something you've done for creatures in a creation that you love and claim as your own. Lord, help us to be resurrection people, the kind of folks who go about our lives convinced that the problems of the day-to-day and of the month and the grand problems of life and even the specter of death are all now shaped, reshaped, and remade in light of the resurrection in real life with you and in you that goes on and on and on. It is so easy, Lord, for us to be faithless about that. We are, like these ladies, just weighed down with the normal stuff. Sometimes the good and hard stuff of life. Break into our lives like you broke out of that tomb. Teach us that you live and call us to a new kind of life. Help us to really and truly be your people that declare to the world he is risen, that live out that life and call others into it with us. Lord, we love you. We know you love us. We find the proof of it in Jesus. And so we pray in his name. Amen. We would like to invite you to stand up with us if you're able.
Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised in the third day according to the scriptures. We're going to sing Men of Sorrows.
He is risen. I always want to do that. All right. Pray with me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day. Thank you for this family that we get to spend it with. We thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. And we ask that you bless this offering that we give. Multiply it and inspire us so that we may use it in a way that's pleasing to you. Amen.
worship team for leading us. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to die. Lord knows when that day is going to be. If any of y'all are around, just remember, I want that song sung at my funeral. I love that. I think it's based on a psalm, isn't it? This is our benediction. Will you pray with me? Come, it comes from the book of Hebrews. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in the full assurance of faith and having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day, the day of his return drawing near. Now, church, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the discipleship of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, be with you this day and in the days to come. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Y'all, if you will be seated for just a second, I have a few announcements to make. Am I on? Yeah, there we go. All right. Hey. Uh, Y'all, I want to mention we don't have our normal Sunday school hour today. Uh, We also don't have some of the normal Sunday evening things that we would have. What we do have is plenty of time to hang out and drink coffee and catch up. If you've not put a flower on that cross, boy, go ahead and put a flower up there. Um, If you, y'all, you can wait for, I mean, look, it's, what is it? Is it every bit of 1109? Hang out for a little while. Have some coffee. 1008. All right, well, looks like I'm going to spend the next week learning how to tell time, so that's good. Uh, It hasn't taken so far, so you might want to pray for me. Um, Hey, but do spend some time with us if you can. I hope that you will. Uh, I also want to mention that we're going to be having a congregational meeting, Uh, so if you are a member of this body, please plan on joining us for that uh, here in just a couple of weeks. Um, uh, Our rhythm is, Joy, correct me if I get this wrong, I think we're saying it's going to be second Sunday's of even months, right? So uh, if that's something that sticks in your brain, that's, that's how we're planning to do that. I hope that you will come and help us make those decisions. Y'all, uh, as a church with congregational polity, my, my belief is that the membership within this body helps us to make decisions more wisely as we listen for the voice of the Spirit together. Uh, you can join us in that if you are a member. Uh, if you are not a member, think about becoming a member. Um, that's something that we take very seriously, something that uh, we think God calls us into as a gathered body of believers in the Baptist uh, tradition and model. Um, Y'all, I also want to mention, finally, uh, we have a wonderful ministry on Wednesday mornings that most of you don't know anything about because you're at work or school. Um, Y'all, we've been doing a, a fellowship ministry uh, it's a senior breakfast. We, it, it came out of the fact that we had a, uh, a, a group of seniors who would get together and have breakfast at the McDonald's, and then all of a sudden there wasn't a McDonald's anymore. And so we kind of uh, lovingly, as a nod to that, took on the name McBaptist for that breakfast. It's funny. Anyway, so y'all, uh, there may be opportunity for you if you have the time or the ability to come and serve within that ministry. That may be something that you can do. Uh, we also have some other needs. Uh, like how to get people who want to be at that breakfast but may have trouble driving, how to get them there, some of those sorts of things. If those are things that you think you might be able to help with, would you email me? Would you copy Lisa Larson on that email? (coughs) Then would you just let us know what your availability might look like? I believe that's it. Y'all, he is risen. risen Thank you for indulging me in that one last time. I love y'all. We'll see you. Bye.